Today, my guest on We Are High Stakes Poker is Jason Kuhn. Now, Jason has always been around the periphery of the best games in the world. But in 2016, something just clicked. And all of a sudden, he was making millions. Today, we talk to him about his backstory. We talk about his purpose. We talk about the vision to the future, the values that guide his life, and what strategies he deployed in life to make him one of the informed, highest stakes poker players on the planet today. Jason, I'm curious. Um, what did you want to be when you was a kid? Uh, I'd say professional baseball player was the first thing. Um, I was really serious about baseball, even into my teens. It would have been my guess to at least like play the minor leagues or something. And uh, that changed once I grew a little bit, developed speed, and realized that track would probably pay for my college. So even though I liked baseball a lot more than I liked track, I'd, I was logical enough to focus on the thing that I was probably going to be better at, at least for scholarships. So it was always uh, physical sports, and then you end up in like kind a of like a mental game. sport. Um, how how did that how did that happen? Was it was it something that impeded your progress when you were younger? So physical? Yeah, it's it's a shame. But being from uh, really poor parts of anywhere, I guess, but or being from a really poor part of the United States in West Virginia. Education for some families may have been valued, but I was the first person in my family to go to college. Uh, I, I knew I wanted to have a good education just solely off the fact that nobody else did and I wanted to say I did it, but I didn't really, um, like I, I wasn't in extracurricular study programs or anything after school as a young kid, which now my favorite things to do are to sit around and learn and read. And um, But as a kid, if I would have uh, been pushed to build the habit, I'm sure I would have loved it, but I think since uh, my surroundings valued physical strength and athleticism. That was kind of the thing that I felt motivated to build up, and I was naturally gifted. So, yeah, I guess uh, it didn't occur to me until university that how much I respected um, the liberation that comes with knowledge and thinking, and uh, I minored in philosophy in college. Once, once that clicked for me, I started really getting into trying to develop my mind. So when you, um, you got into philosophy, that is when you decided that you would prefer something more mind-related than physical? There was no like injury or no inability to get into a team or anything like that? Uh, no, I, uh, I, was, I was thriving in college well. track. Uh, yeah, and then I did have an injury. I had a hip injury that uh, put, me on, put me on the bed and a roommate of mine suggested that we started playing poker for fun and you know, one of those stories and then boom, it just <laughs> took off. I was buying every book and reading every book and I started playing online and just nights turned into days before I, you know, it was the time warp, and before you knew it, I was a poker player. It's incredible that the game has that effect. I remember talking to Roberto Romanello about the same thing, loved football, broke his leg, was devastated, had to play poker at the same time, and boom, it just kind of took over his life. Yeah, it's, uh, it's that flow state, you know, it's, that, it's where it's that little narrow area of thought where you get where there's no thinking at all. You're just in this, like, tunnel, mm. and Time disappears, all of your worries disappear, for better or worse sometimes, and you're just thinking about the best way to make a move. Uh, I think it's that happens you know, when you're in the blocks for a uh, track meet or if you're sprinting down the field to score a goal, you're in a different world. You're not thinking of anything else, and I think that small amounts of that are very healthy, and, and you can see it with a lot of people that flow state or uh, addiction becomes dangerous. You have to be able to accept the fact that you can't always be in there and, and step out of it, but as competitors, that's what we're looking for, and that's where that the, the exact same need is reached if it's sitting in a poker table or kicking a ball and goal. And you, you talked a little bit there about having an injury and, and that setback. What other major challenges have you had in your life that you've had to hurdle over and what value have you taken out of them that you've put back into your life and made a success yourself? Uh, since the beginning it's been very very hard. I was homeless at one point in my life. Um, grew up very poor, was physically abused by my father. Um, but I got really tough and persistent and uh, my other family members, my mother and my siblings instilled confidence in me. Uh, I always felt like I had something, some kind of value, some kind of something bigger than what I was in that moment. Uh, and that confidence helped me retain the drive to learn and improve. Um, so going through uh, walls has always been easy for me because I've just always kind of had, had it in the back of my mind that I could do it. I never thought that 
I would get to the level that I'm at in poker. Um, and that's mainly because whenever I started, I, I didn't have the right group around me. I mean, you can't. In the beginning, you're just on your own, you know? Don't know anybody. Yeah, you don't know anybody, you're in there. And then, uh, luckily, a lot of the, the best people and players, uh, we've, we've found mutual value with one another and, and really developed some strong friendships. And over the course of a decade, uh, we've all gotten better. And poker is, is the thing that we all love and really dive into and can, you know, some of my best buddies are the best poker players in the world and much more gifted than me. So they've kind of put me on their back and picked me up and, you know, pushed me to the level that I'm at now, which is just like surreal. I can't believe that it's like, whoa, I get to compete on this level. It's the highest level in the game and I'm here doing it. I was reading some Charles Bukowski last night when I went to bed and the guy's crazy, but I, I love I love his writing. It's like really dirty and raw, which is exactly what I am. And he was, he was writing a poem about the time when his father died, and his father used to beat him, like, badly. Yeah. Um, but I was reading it, and there was, there was this almost, like, respect there, and I didn't understand it because that had never happened to me as a child, and the original thought is that you would be, like, completely anti. Um, how did your relationship develop with your father um, with him being abusive? Uh, it's non-existent, but there, there is... Uh a ton of forgiveness that I've kind of walked down the path of and I don't carry any resentment at all in my heart anymore. It's something that negatively fueled me but it did fuel me to get to where I'm at. That anger was uh, an incredible motivator and you know in the beginning it was quite dangerous because I didn't have the discipline to kind of hit the brakes and um, shut my mouth sometimes or whatever. I was very very angry but I also had the chip on my shoulder that no one's gonna stop me, nothing's gonna stop me. And then as I got older, I realized like, whoa, you gotta, that, that's something to get you here, but it's, it's unsustainable to be angry and motivated. And uh, it's been a long process, but I understand that, um, for me, it's almost like a, um, I, I feel bad for him in a lot of ways, you know? I'm like, man, uh, uh, I, I can't wait to have kids. I can't wait to be a father and, and get to watch my kids thrive and do whatever it is that they decide they want to do um, and watch them grow. And just thinking like, man, it, it would be a bummer to have a couple kids out there who are taking on life without you, who are becoming people, adults, successful at whatever it is that they're doing. And uh, I don't know, it would feel like such a waste to me, you know? So it's like less anger now, I'm more like, man, it's, it's, it's a shame that he can't see what I'm doing firsthand, you know. I'm sure he can see from the outside, but so it's it's so be it. And, and it's not like one of those things that I have any desire whatsoever to salvage, you know, because it's, it's there's a lot more to it than, oh, we're both angry, let's make this right. It's, it's a much more sophisticated puzzle than that, and there's some things that just can't be fixed. I mean, I'm a, I'm a father myself, you know, and uh, my father never gave me any love. My, my stepfather, who I knew all my life, my biological father I never met. And people say, do you want to meet him? Like, nope. Nah. Uh, do you want to build a relationship with your father who never gave you any love? Nope. And to me, it's kind of like family doesn't have to be blood. It's whoever treats you well and 100%. you feel a deep connection with, right? Exactly right, yeah. So many of my comrades that I've met through poker are now just life buddies, lifers, you know. Hmm. Um, I, I, it's it's almost enviable like to look around and see the, the group around me. People are blown away, like holy shit, these guys are your pals. I'm like, yeah, I, I don't get it, man. I don't get it, but yeah, this is the family. You're very, now. You're very humble. I'm pretty sure they say same well, thing about you. I'm entertaining in a lot of ways, I guess, <laughs> but it's still just uh, really, really deep uh, cemented bonds with guys that are it's as as good as blood. And yeah, it's uh, that group's all the family I'll ever need for sure. And, and, and those challenges and those tough times, I imagine given the personality and the person you are today and the values that you have, and we'll touch on values a little bit later on, I don't think you'd ever change anything, would you? No, you can't now at this point. I, I, I mean, the damage is done, and to think about the process that a, a child would have to go through, uh, it would like break my heart. But at this point, it's like, okay, we're here now, so you get the good stuff and we're working on the bad stuff. Don't ditch it. Yeah, for sure. You, 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 you always learn something good out of some terrible adversity. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Every time. Um, and, and, and talking on and expanding a little bit more on your conversation about these great people who surround you. 
Who have been the biggest inspirations in your life? And they, they don't have to be poker. We can go back as, as far back as you want. Who are the Who are the people you can pinpoint that have really been beneficial to you? Well, like I said, my, my brother, my mother, and my brother, and my sister as well were gigantic influences on my life and gigantic amounts of support. And then um, a couple childhood friends were great. And um, currently, you know, the past decade, I've built a, a squad of most of the guys are known poker players that are my best friends. It just happened to work out that way. Um, and the, the guys that you would know that I'm closest with are Ben Tollerine, who's Ben86 online, and David Benefield, and Isaac Haxton, Phil Galfond, um, and some tourney, some tourney guys like Nick Ramponi and uh, Steve Gross, Seth Davies, these guys I'm, I'm really, really tight with. And then the biggest influence in my day-to-day -day life is by far my girlfriend. She's uh, kind of saved me in a sense. Like I, I'm not saying I was down this like road to destruction. I wasn't. I was definitely focused and living very well. But when she came into my life, it was uh, she kind of started calling me out on things that I didn't even notice I was doing wrong. Just being more reactive in my life and saying, "Hey, you know, that's that's not socially acceptable. Let's hit the brakes here. There's other ways to handle things than always macho up and uh, yelling isn't necessary. Or cussing at this or that. It's just completely negative energy and." Her just kind of keeping me in check, but also always being supportive and never complaining about like being on another flight or in another hotel room, just always having everything I need for me to succeed. It's ridiculous. If you look at my tournament results from the day that we were together, it's like I had like two and a half million in earnings or something when we got together three years and uh, two months ago. Now I have 13 million and it's like, yeah, it's just ridiculous, the heater that I've been on, because back in the day, it took me a long time to kind of get back on my feet and, and get ready to play the next thing and get focused, but she's just always there to help me recover faster and push me and not let me feel sorry for myself. So Bianca's uh, the biggest influence in my life. Yeah, you was, um, there's this great uh, plethora of fantastic, wonderfully talented people. And then there's a few more who are just a little bit above that who just whether they get the right luck, the flow state that we were talking about that, that bank the results. And you definitely, you popped your head up there and you won a result and then another one and then all of a sudden the caches that you were making were very deep, very big. Yes, and less attachment to the, to the money in general. You know, like when you're single and you're kind of wondering the world and you're just thinking, oh, like people are gonna find me more valuable and you're looking for this external uh, validation. And then once your life feels more intact, you stop wanting the false things or the the shallow things and then they just come to you in a weird way and then you're like oh yeah this, this isn't that important you know i often think like as a kid i would go to the lake and fish and i never felt more free or happier just like sitting there and i, I did this like 300 days a year as a kid i lived half a mile from the lake mm. and often I'll, I'll be sitting like you know going to play this giant tournament and i'm sitting in my hotel room I'm thinking like, oh yeah, it's it's been like 20 years since I felt that way, you know, like that that kind of happiness. Whenever I was a kid on welfare, completely broke with a fishing rod in my hands, like, uh, and then little bits of that come back into my life, not from owning nice cars or homes or whatever. I mean, it's a cliche cliche thing, but it's so true. It's like uh, you shouldn't be searching for happiness or validation. You should just be living a life that's fulfilling to you and just let the rest come to you and not expect too much. It's really difficult, isn't it, with society? Because you you think that it's related to cash, yeah. And, and and your metric for success is how much I earn, and comparable to everybody else in my inner circle. And it's not really until you you make the money, or or somebody like a mentor picks you up and makes you see things differently. It's very difficult to project forward, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's ingrained in our society. People say, "Oh, he's successful," and that always means he makes a lot of money. Yeah. Always. I mean, it's. What, is, what does that even mean? He's successful. Is he miserable and screams at his wife? Well, That's what, was not we really just, what, was, what did we start off talking about? Parenting. Exactly. You know, yeah. what do we want to be? What would we give to be great parents? We'd give every single penny, right? For our child to look at us and think, I want to be my dad, you know? For sure. Exactly right. Yeah. So just even hearing that uh, is just the, the wrong place to begin. And that is where I was at. I mean, even the, once I started having success, in poker, I was just like, oh, let's buy this car, let's do this, let's do that. And then the next thing I know, I'm just like, wow, I'm a douchebag. I need to <laughs> hit the brakes on this, go back to doing what I like to do. What were the, uh, what were the early jobs that you had that um, you, can, you, you can clearly identify value that you've brought into your, your career as a high stakes poker player? 
Uh, well, I was a finance MBA in college, and that small amount of math that I was focusing on whenever I wasn't playing poker has actually benefited me learning how to use spreadsheets and be a little more organized or whatever. That That's helped. Sports helped a lot, man. Uh, coming back from a major injury, uh, playing team games, uh, sports were a very big deal. I, I fought, too. I boxed, and that was good for mental toughness uh, and discipline. And then I, I did get a job out of college, but it didn't really do anything for me other than help me have the realization that, oh, yeah, I really need to play poker. This, I don't want this a job. isn't my thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so... Uh, that would really be the only It does job. take that sometimes, though. In, in life, we sometimes have to take a vow, right? We have to say, I'm, I, I am, I'm never going to have, I'm never going to work for anyone. And then that vow allows you to then make the correct decisions beyond it because you're never going back beyond that point. No. I mean, I had $115,000 surgery in college debt. I got screwed with a surgery bill. And I had about $7,000 in my bankroll. And I quit a job that was... Starting at sixty-five thousand US a year, and could have with incentives been over a hundred k, and I just like knew it wasn't right. I was like, I'm broke and in debt, but I think I can win a poker, and I and it makes me happy to do it, and I just did it. What is it that makes a Jason Kuhn or an Isaac Axton or a, or a Daniel Jungerman Cates shun that journey, which is is almost like handpicked by society? Like it's like we're designed to go down this way and to live this life and to get the mortgage we can't afford and the job we hate. What is it about this core group of people who have said, no, 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 no. We're gonna take the contrary view. Is there anything that stands out for you? Yeah, I think it's just like uh, the courage to make a decision on what you think is actually best for you, to value yourself more than what other people are gonna think about you. Like in the greater scheme of things, I, I was like, oh man, I'm probably going to, or there's a chance I fail at this and I'm going to be mocked for quitting my job and going to school and doing this and that. And I was deeply afraid of that, but it, I wasn't afraid enough to just like live, to accept that my life was going to be that, you know? And I think some people are very happy in that structure. Like, like it's not necessarily a bad thing to be like in the society's nine to five and work the job. If you come home with a smile on your face and you feel good about your life, that's cool. But for me... It just felt empty to me. I, I didn't like, like, I had to sit around a table and drink with these guys we were trying to sell stuff to and, like, laugh at their shitty jokes. And it just wasn't, for me, I was like, man, I want to sleep in when I want. You know, I, I want to, it was like a freedom thing, you know. Uh, but that being said, it's like I've still been a slave to myself several times throughout my poker career. It's like I've made thousands of mistakes in that same line of thinking of, like, oh, I'm making a lot of money right now, so I just need to play like 80 hours a week. And then the next thing you know, I lose 15 pounds. I'm like feeling like shit. I'm stressed out. Um, and that's the exact same mindset. You know, I need to get all of this paper and put it in my bank account uh, because I can. And then, you, you know, you're no better off. So it's really just constantly reflecting and resetting and just saying, I want to live a life that is at least what I think is directed in the way that I want to be, what, how I want to live. We're always influenced by things constantly, and it's like that deprogramming is really hard because we're all influenced to believe that we like things that we probably wouldn't in a vacuum, you know, without pressure. Uh, yeah, so I'm just like always doing my best to reevaluate, listen to the people around me, look at the situation around me, and try to stay in that line of this is the most fulfilling thing for myself and not waste time having judgment for the way other people are living. I remember in 2009 when I stopped drinking alcohol and uh, one of the coaches that was helping me at the time, they, they were asking me what the values were that were guiding my life. And I didn't even know what the word meant. I, I'd, I'd got to like 35 years of age and I did not understand what a value was, you know. Yeah. Um, what are the core values that, that drive your life and, and why are they important to you? Um, the One of the top values is I want to... have almost like a, a, I want to radiate comfort and safety for everyone that I care the most about. I want to impact their lives in a way where it's a net positive for everyone. Um, not just financially, not just emotionally. I just, I want to grab the people that have looked out for me since the beginning and that we're growing with and I just want us all to move forward together. Um, so to be a value, uh, deep value to the people I'm closest with, that's a big one. 
I, like I said, to be in line with what I think is best for me and most fulfilling with me, not just what uh, makes me happiest. Uh, to be, to continually grow with, with uh, at this point, using the word girlfriend strange because we're more than that. We're going to be married soon. And, yeah. But my, my person, you know, uh, continue to grow for her and with her. Uh, that's just like so important to me. You know, I, there's a lot of things that I guess I could put on paper that add up to this big important equation. But really, I, I, I life is simple in a sense. You know, like I do want to do all these great things for people and and push myself and do this and that, but it it's also just very simple. I just want to live my life in a way that I'm like, oh, I feel good about this. And then like when I'm 80, hopefully that's cool, but I don't care about leaving a legacy or, you know, or being like well known. I, I really, in the beginning, I, I cared about that stuff. I just don't anymore. I just want to wake up and have a little weight off my shoulders and be happy about what what's happening and yeah, and just feel good and continue to grow. That's really it. Figure it out, you know, evolve the species, I guess. What screamed out to me then was like family and trust, which then makes me think that, as you were saying earlier on, having this wonderful group of people around you that are helping you grow both personally and in poker, these kind of ethics, these values, if you didn't have them, it would be really difficult to fit into these tribes that are now helping you and you obviously helping them, yeah? Yeah, yeah. that's it. It's what do you um, what do you see when you look at the world, Jason? Um, wow, that's a that's a good one. Uh, well, sadly, the things that stand out to me the most right now are how we're all kind of being manipulated uh, by big money uh, and technology. There's so much. Like I, I see, it, I'm from a small town, and there's so many wonderful people there that'll stop and have. A, talk with you and they're just sweet and they never forget your name and do everything that uh, a neighbor would ever do. You know, they're always looking out for each other and it's really sweet things, but small town people also aren't exposed to uh, the right amount of awareness, you know? Like I didn't see it, they're very um, closed off in that sense. And I think that that's the, the majority of people aren't, uh, are being manipulated by these, these systems, uh, by advertisements, by uh, political agendas, just constant, uh, these, uh, the um, neurofeedback, like the dopamine feedback loops that people are, you know, like Instagrams and Facebooks, and that shit's addictive, man. Yeah. And there's, you know, it's like so addictive to be like, whoa, this feels so good, this person like 1,700 likes, this is, you know. We I, better this... get a lot of likes for this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, I had so many friends, this was so great, this, you know, whatever, and if you're influencing society in a positive way, that's fine. But if you're continually looking for these things to just make you feel better about yourself, it's just a trap, you know. And uh, I think that that's just what's happening. It's sad to see it happening to the youth. I'm sure there's a lot of great things happening too. Like uh, just having a talk with a friend, and it's easy to be hard on your parents, but your parents didn't get to listen to TED talks with the world's greatest thinkers or uh, you know seminars or getting to read all these. Google any Google any, anything. anything you want, and there's enlightenment in that stuff too. There's trash everywhere, but there's also enlightenment and truth if you look for it. Um, and and yeah, that's a weapon that you know if, if you're smart, you're going to grow with. But it's uh, it's like a it's like a big piece of cake. You know, a little bit of it's probably good and healthy, but if you eat the whole cake, it's going to taste good in the moment, but ruin you. And that's kind of the internet in a nutshell. You know, like if you really dive into that, you're going to be in trouble because you're just being manipulated and controlled. Uh, so yeah, that that worries me. I, uh, the technological manipulation is a really big threat. You're you're not alone. <laughs> yeah, I, I deleted my Facebook account the other day. Um, I look at my mum. She wakes up in the morning. She gets a newspaper from the front door. She switches the telly on. It's on until she falls asleep, and that's her world. Yeah. Whatever you want to sell me, that is what I'm going to believe. Yeah. And poker takes you away from that. Poker sits you down next to a black person, a yellow person, a white person, whatever, sure. you know, any kind of gender, and you really do get to see the world from a completely different view, don't you? Yeah, you just get to meet amazing people, left and right. What are the, um, what are the problems that are popping up in your life uh, that you uh, haven't to deal with on a regular basis? Uh, being overworked is uh, a big one. Whenever I'm, anytime I'm tired, I'm, disposed to the the weaknesses that I carry 
uh, that's when the anger would surface. That's when the lack of discipline to take a couple deep breaths and not panic would happen. So, uh, so if I'm overworked, then things start happening. Stress starts to happen without that balance. So uh, lately I've been going really, really hard and it's kind of in the sense of like the opportunity cost of not playing right now is is too high and then in a couple of years we're gonna have kids and everything's gonna slow down but I really have to have discipline and stick to that idea you know I can't just like be one of these people that says I'm gonna work really hard now and then live a good life at the end I have to make sure I do that or not even at the end in a few years so hopefully 35 isn't the end um, so yeah the biggest problem with me is always working on that balance of letting off the throttle of poker and taking enough time to work on the things that uh, the damage that I carry. And how do you, how do you switch off? How do you battle those anger demons and quiet them down? What, what, is, what is preventing you from booming and having a deep breath? Uh, like I said, the most important thing's definitely been the help of my girlfriend. She's also, uh, we're both avid with meditation, exercise, um, zooming out. You know, that's, just, I was talking to Jungle Man about this yesterday, actually. It's just like, as simple as it is, just a few times a day, just zoom out of your situation and think about how it's like we're sitting by the sea right now in Montenegro, you know, and I was just playing some nosebleed tournament and this and that. It's just like an amazing life. And if, if I would have been talking to my 21-year-old self and been like, dude, you know, you're going to be doing this, I would have been so stoked. So just zoom out. Take a deep breath. Yeah, it's, it's uh, very important to just... Meditation is really important, I think. It's enormous. I mean, when you said to me, you said to me yesterday, I'm just going to go and meditate and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to win this thing. Yeah. Um, I was like, oh, the world is definitely changing. Yeah. <laughs> there would have been a time where it was a break and someone would just been on their mobile phone for two minutes playing some poker and then we'd be back there again. Yeah, no, not me. You, like, just wake up and jump in the sea and sit down and meditate. Those things just bring me, uh, they bring me fulfillment, you know, and gratitude, just being so stoked about how pretty this bird was. I was sitting outside today and this beautiful like yellow bird landed beside me and I just sat there for about a minute staring at that thing and I was just like, yeah, that's kind of the point of being alive is just to appreciate something like that. Yeah, no, I like that. Um, before 2018 started, did you have one particular goal in mind that you wanted to accomplish and have you accomplished it? Um, no, I, I'm, I wouldn't, I'm very disciplined in my life. That is one thing I'm good at, you know, I. I'm very disciplined with my diet and my habits. Uh, so I don't need the big goals in front of me. I do, I guess, visualize things, what I, what I think is the right direction for me to head. Um, but I'm never like, okay, I'm gonna play 35 tournaments or I'm gonna play 60 hours of cash games this week or whatever. Uh, it's more just like be in line with what you want and then every day have tons of different little tiny goals that you work on achieving rather than just the big giant thing. Maybe that's a mistake, but that is the way I do it. So not you're not like a vision board, um, writing down in your journal type of guy. No, I'm not. You kind of know where to, you're going. Exactly. I don't need to make this much money. I don't need to acquire this, this much of anything. It's just more like go step by step and make sure every decision I make is plus EV. That's really it. And what makes poker so important to you? Uh, well, it's, uh, it's, it's been kind of the conduit to all of this, uh, not just financial freedom, but just to, like I said, enlightenment through meeting great people. Uh, that happened to be my thing. I'm sure there's a hundred other things I could have done and they would have worked out great, but this happened to be, in this simulation, this was my, my thing. Uh, so I'll forever be grateful that I've, I've found that. I know that when you're young, whenever I was in college, I really had no clue what I wanted to do. You know, so just to fall into something that you like to do and you could actually make a living at, it's really special. Um, so I always have love for it. Are there any risks, you know, that you're not taking now that you should be? I'm hardly ever guilty of that. <laughs> I was listening to you yesterday uh, playing and I could tell that there is, uh, there's no, <laughs> there's no uh, worries on that score. I mean, it's one of the plus points of being a great poker player, right? You need it, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you have to be able to draw a line of, you know, uh, Has it always reasonable. been like that? Have you always been like that? Or did poker kind of sharpen that kind of thing? Oh, for you? I, I've always been a, a kind of, you uh, needed to keep that side of me in check. You know, I was the kid that wanted to jump off the roof of the house into the grass or off the cliff into the lake or whatever. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even necessarily say thrill seeker is the right word. I, I don't think it is, but just to kind of always push the boundaries a little bit. It's been nice. And, and, you know, moving outside of the confines of poker a little bit, you did say earlier on that you mentioned the word legacy. 
I mean, Phil Ivey's now playing heads up at the minute, isn't he, against Jungle Man, and he once said that he had a legacy to win X amount of bracelets, times change, you know? Yeah. Is there anything that you want to be leaving this, this part of our life, this earth, this whatever happens when we die? Is there anything that you want to look back and say, I really have to nail this before I go? Uh, being a father and a husband, yeah. Or a uh, partner, whatever you call that. Um, I guess we'll call it husband and wife, because mm. I assume we're going to get married soon. Uh, if she'll have me, I guess. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, being a, being a dad, I want to be, you know, and that's, that's also, I was thinking about this, like, I've thought about this hundreds of times. It's like, something shitty happened to me as a kid. Uh, you know, you weren't tight with your dad. Uh, my dad completely fucked me over in so many ways. You're stoked about being a dad. You're a great dad. And I'm going to be like a full-time all-in dad. So there is kind of like this, this balance that happens. Something bad happens, and then this person's going to make up for it oftentimes. And then the next generation gets to have this great life that, who knows, maybe I'd be like this lazy, unmotivated, spoiled brat if I was just treated great as a kid. You know, I'm sure there's there's things about me that would be better, but I'm gonna be a good dad because of this. It's like it's the dichotomy of pain and suffering, isn't it? You, as a father, you look at your children and you really don't want them to suffer, but there's a part of you that's like, oh man, they need to. Yeah, you gotta <laughs> Because if they, if they don't, yeah, if they haven't got no skin in the game, they're not gonna grow. Yeah. So I'm not gonna protect him from that kid who's about to bash his head in. Yeah. You know, e e even now my, my wife's telling me that I'm, I've got an 18 month old and a 17 year old and she's saying I'm far too protective over the, the 17 month old. Um, what makes a great dad? How, how are, you, are you thinking about that? Yeah, I think uh, being present, just being around, um, being open minded and not trying to uh, tell them how to live their life, you know? I want to give advice and always look out, but at the same time, I want, no matter what they end up wanting to be or who they end up becoming, I just want to support that and kind of be a guide, but not a person that's managing their life, you know? Hmm. Um, so yeah, be there, be stable, be emotionally solid. I like the presence one, very, very, very important. So something that I've realized later in life, having a child later in life. I'm just moving on to strategies before we, we end up you are now playing at the highest echelon in the game. Yep. You, you said yourself that sometimes you're kind of pinching yourself and looking around and saying, I'm, I'm actually in this game. Yeah. What are the resources and the tools that people need to have in their life if they're going to reach the top? And it, it could be the top in anything. We're talking about poker right now, right? Sure. But we could be talking about reaching the top in life, whatever our perception is, or sure. gas fitting. You know, what, what are the tools and resources that have helped you out? Uh, the first thing uh, that, that would come to mind is you need to refrain from being judgmental and always keep an open mind and listen to people. Listen to people that have succeeded. It's really easy to be like, oh, you know, this guy's 65 and doesn't play No Limit well. So, and this is just my example, my poker example. So there's nothing for me to learn from him at the poker table. And then like you might just learn this super valuable gambling lesson from a guy who's gambled for 40 years and save you from something. Uh, never sit around and pat yourself on the back enough that you're, that you're gonna shut people off from giving you valuable information. Just always assume somebody has something valuable to give you. And surround yourself by people that, like we were saying, that you know you can move forward with. And maybe you feel like I always feel like my friends are so far out of my league. I mean, David's like this Ivy League grad who like was playing nosebleeds when he's 19 and like him and Durr like bought a house together before I knew the rules to poker and you know, and now he's like the like some Bitcoin extraordinaire and I'm, I'm like hanging out with this guy just going like, why is he hanging out with me? I mean, am I just like a bodyguard for this guy? <laughs> or, um, and that's the thing, surround yourself with guys that you feel like, or girls that you feel like that with, that you just kind of feel, you know, they're always pushing you a little bit. You're always like, whoa, that's a profound thought or whatever. I think that's the biggest one. It's just like, there's really no secret. If you, if you listen, you keep the ego in check and you truly love what it is that you want to move forward at, then you, you really can't lose. I don't think it's, it, the, the reason I'm successful is I've been doing the same thing for 11 years straight. And every day I learn from somebody who's better than I am, every single day, you know? And I'm persistent and I get on the horse and I study because I enjoy it. But if I hated studying, I, I just wouldn't do it. And like if I was a person trying to teach a poker player and they were just like, man, I really love to play, but I don't really like to study, I'd probably be like, you should probably go do another job then, you know? Because it shouldn't feel like, yeah, it's work, it's hard, but when you're done, you feel good about it. 
How important is communication in all this? Because it seems to be pretty integral, right? If we're going to be building relationships and levering, leveraging those relationships in a good way and not a, not a fake way, we talked earlier on, didn't sure. we, about not, not liking fake and really thriving on authenticity. We're never taught communication in school. I mean, what was you like growing up as a communicator? And when did things change? Did you learn, read books? Well, how did it work out? Yeah, I think like one of my appeals to people is like oftentimes people will think I'm like fake at first because I'm pretty open. You know, I'm pretty open to say how I feel in that moment. And I do my best to just always be honest with people. And um, I think that it was like therapy for me. A lot of the times in my life, like having that vulnerability was kind of me releasing a lot of hurt, a lot of bad stuff that happened to me. Um, and then in that sense, people grow to trust you because they're like, oh yeah, well this guy would share that with me. You know, I'm cool to share this with him kind of thing. Um, and it is real. Uh, so the communication with me, even if I wasn't kind of taught uh, emotional intelligence or really taught how to communicate, I was just always kind of going into it like we're human beings, we're all dealing with stuff. Nobody's really that special. And that's, that's the one constant that I've learned. Like no matter who it is I'm hanging out with, uh, it might be this person that you, that you looked up to or uh, that you saw on TV and you thought was like this larger than life figure. And then you shoot the breeze with them and you realize they're just dealing with the same shit we all are. So I'm just always in that, like, in that area of like, hey, if you want to share something with me, that's cool. I'll share something with you and we'll just lay it all on the table and move forward from there. Sounds like you're talking about the power of vulnerability and it's really interesting coming from someone who, you know, we could define you as like the uh, stereotypical uh, masculine male kind of yeah. big muscles, chiseled, jawed, good looking guy. He's never going to be vulnerable. but. It's, it's super powerful, right? Yeah, it is. And I, I've always been kind of the anti-bully because I was bullied, you know? So it's like, I did get big and muscular and mean and got in a lot of fights and stuff, but I, even though my area, I think, uh, since there's not the, a lot of information flying around there, there might be a lot of intolerance in the area. I was never a phobic of anything or anyone. Like I was the exact opposite. If I saw somebody like being slightly racist or homophobic or whatever, I was really defensive of that. Right. Because I could identify with that. I could identify by a person who was oppressed, you know? So, um, yeah, I've always kind of overcompensated to protect people. It's good that you, you put that back in check because uh, as someone who's been bullied for being Chinese when I was younger, all of a sudden you're 43 and you, you're still that little kid yeah. trying to protect yourself just because someone's now trying to tell you what to do in terms of are you, are you sure? <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like, it's really hard, isn't oh, it? Oh, for sure, yeah, you just snap on Yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how, do you, how do you measure your success then, Jason? We talked a little bit about money not being the ultimate, f you know, you've, you've earned like 15 million or whatever on Hendema, but what, how do you measure success? Um, uh, feeling really comfortable in my own skin. Uh, Looking around and seeing people that I love taken care of, um, feeling life inside of me, you know, feeling like I'm almost like that childlike excitement for things. As long as I retain a little bit of that, I feel like I'm doing a good job. Uh, yeah, there, it's all between the ears, you know. It's like there are things needed for uh comforts and securities and having money can do that and you know i like good food and i like nice things between the walls and you know big windows and all that so make enough to appreciate my view where i'm at and uh have good relationships with the people i value most and and constantly feel hungry and i think that that's just it i don't think there's much more than that and how does poker make you feel um it feels like it's the right thing for me to be doing. You know, it doesn't feel like I've, it's the end for me. It doesn't feel like, uh, I don't feel that urge to like, oh, it's time to move on to the new thing. I still feel very much like I need to be in the seat. This is the proper time for me to play poker. Jason, thank you very much. Really enjoyed our time together Ooh, and loved it. Yeah. I'm Jason Kuhn and I am High Stakes Poker.